Welcome to this edition of When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine, a discussion of sustainable living and what that means to you and me. I'm Jay Warmke. And I'm Annie Warmke. And today we're going to talk about seeds and seed savings, or why am I growing paranoid? Wow, that must yeah, be a new drug or something. I, I, well, I don't know. I'm growing something. But, uh, <laughs> Actually, I'm not grow- <laughs> <Beard>. <laughs> growing older. Okay, so let's talk about the need to save seeds. All right, try to be serious, Jay. Come <laughs> all on. All right, all right. Uh, this is this is really your your field. Um, I'm I'm field, not the, that's a play on I'm not the farmer. Too. I'm not the gardener. I'm not the the uh, animal care person. That's that's <laughs> you, Miss Mother Nature. So tell us why we should be saving seeds. Well, let me say before we start that there are a couple of resources that people can go to if they want to follow up afterwards, and I don't want to forget that. But one that I really like is seedsavers.org, and um, they're a great organization. They've been around a long time, and they they get it right. And then, of course, blueroxstation.com. We have a natural gardening booklet and a PDF form that people can access there uh, for a small fee that talks about companion planting and seeds and all kinds of cool stuff. And, um, and there's lots of resources online. But the reality is the reason that we want to save seeds is because, for me, it's an act of revolution. We, we need to have access to lots of different kinds of seeds because we um, are destroying them at such a fast pace. And the likes of Monsanto and DuPont and um, Syngentra are gobbling up uh, seed banks and seeds. uh, Right. We'll talk about the evil empire here in a bit. All right. So the reason that we really want to save seeds is it gives us a lot of access to – to be able to grow things. Seeds are life. You take a seed and you hold it in your hand and it's pretty exciting because it holds DNA, it holds the past, it holds the future. Well, I know when we were watching this movie, um, Seeds. The Seeds, Untold Story. The untold it's a great film, story. by the way. Somebody, you yeah, should uh, it's it. one of those, though, that, you know, the, the deeper it goes into this whole issue around seeds and seed savings and, and the evilness of the large corporations that are sort of taking over that, um, you know, it sort of drifts you down into this sense of hopelessness. But I think hopefully what we're going to talk about here today is that you can take control of a bit of this. You can, uh, I mean, seeds are by their very nature, it's something you can harvest, hold back, and then plant again. Well, and the then right harvest seeds. Again. The yeah, right seeds. And that's something weird. But I was surprised, and I think it was in that movie or maybe a different movie where it talked about how Ninety-four percent of all the different plant species have been lost, um, and we were debating this whether it's twenty years or fifty years. Yeah, the either last way, few it's like in our lifetime. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's kind of that's kind of amazing that ninety-four percent of all the different life forms, plant life forms, are just vominos yeah. gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and part of the problem too is that we're down to eating about ten different plants. Um, and when there are so many other choices, but corporations have brought us to this, mm-hmm. and also lifestyle, culturally, uh, lifestyle has brought us to these 10 uh, plants. And so what we have to do, though, if we want to save seeds, is we have to uh, know what kind of seeds that we're going to save. And by that, I mean, are we going to save heirloom seeds or are we going to save hybrid seeds? And we don't want to save hybrid seeds because if it's been modified in some way, they've taken different strong points from DNA from other uh, types of seeds, and they brought it into that seed to try to make it more determinant, as they call it. That's the term. So non-determinant would be heirloom. So we don't know how long the vine's going to get. It might be longer this year or lo- shorter. Uh, it might be bigger. It might be smaller. It's not consistently the same, but that's a good thing. Uh, the hybrid seed is going to consistently produce, if the circumstances are right, the soil's right, and the pH level's right in the soil, uh, is going to produce the same thing every single time unless you save the seed. And then if you try to regrow that from 
the seed, that plant, it's going to bring out other qualities, like maybe it'll be a different color or even a different taste because it's got these strong other pieces of DNA. Like the recessive genes. Yes, recessive genes. Well, is there a difference between um, genetically modified and hybrid? I mean, I, yes, I, it seems because, to me there should be. Yeah, there is. Genetically modified means that they've brought in something totally unrelated to that seed. So maybe they took some pig DNA and injected it into that plant or that seed. And so now it has pig DNA. And I don't think it can grow back to being a pig. But uh, no, we don't want to ever use mm-hmm. uh, GMO seeds. It doesn't, nature doesn't like that. And of course, the deeper you explore into GMO, it, it gets really, I'm, I'm almost Frankenstein ish, yeah, if it does. that's a word, where they take these weird, it's almost like these scientists are going, I wonder what will happen. If we take an octopus I know, yeah. and we cross it with a cucumber, you know, what are we going to get? And no, nothing in nature would do that naturally. And so it's well, totally unnatural. Well, it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so what we want are heirloom seeds. And heirloom seeds are often seeds that have been saved and passed on from one generation for thousands of years even. And that's exciting to think about that we can grow foods today that our ancestors for many generations back grew. And that's what we really need to be doing. And it is an act of revolution because there are so many things that have been put in place to stop us from saving seeds and collecting seeds. And it's almost a no-brainer process to do it. And if you don't want to learn from this podcast, you can go online to YouTube or just about any place and you can learn simple ways to save seeds. It's a it's a great thing to do. So well, we Well, when you say that things have come into place to keep you from saving seeds, um, I found it interesting when we we're looking at this that um, in recent years, there have been a number of court cases that have led to this weird, crazy situation we're in today where companies can actually patent life forms. Yeah. You know, and and not only life forms, they can patent the seed, they can plat- patent the plant, but they end up holding the patent on every offspring that comes forever and ever, amen, into the right. future. And and really, this has just started in, in say, 1981 in, in a court case called Diamond versus Chakravarti. And uh, that was where this uh, Chakravarti was a biologist, I guess, who developed a bacteria that could eat oil spills and ended up patenting that. And the Supreme Court said, yep, okay, it's okay to patent life. Although the original patent law written by Thomas Jefferson pretty much specifically said, no, said, no. no you right. can't patent life. That's but right. um, but in our in our world of corporations, we can now patent life and not only life, but all the babies that come beyond. That reminds right. me of something that used to exist, maybe still does exist. Seems to me we fought a civil war about that somewhere. But yeah, mm-hmm. good point. Yep. That's a good point, Jay. Uh-huh. Thank you for that. That's <laughs> touching. Well, so let's move past trying to patent life forms because we don't want to be in that business, and that has absolutely everything that we don't believe in involved in it. We want to look at being sustainable in our practices. And being sustainable then means that we're going to look for heirloom or what they call open pollinated seeds. And by that is that uh, open pollinated seed it has distinct characteristics as long as it's mated with an individual of the same breed. So like being like. And that's pretty important. So those seeds come in a lot of varieties, annual, biannual, perennial. So annual seeds mean that annually you're going to have to plant again. Biannual means the first year the plant sets its plant and its roots, and the second year it sets its seed and then it dies. And perennial means it goes on and on and on unless something happens, it's too wet or too dry or whatever. So it doesn't matter, it's in terms of annual, biannual, uh, perennial, it just needs to be open pollinated or heirloom. So some examples would be, Annuals would could be lettuce, tomatoes, peppers, and those are all easy things to save seed from. Biannuals could be carrots, onions, root crops, cabbage, parsley, Brussels sprouts. And then perennials are things like apple trees and asparagus, 
um, some some kinds of uh, bulbs that can just keep coming back. But the point is, there's huge variety out there. Well, our apple trees never seem to actually be perennial. They. Uh, they no, we have one that came from seed that <laughs> well, got thrown true. out with the dish hey, detergent, which everybody said couldn't saver. happen. Mm-hmm. That's right. And it has early harvest apples on it that fall on your head when you come out the back door. So mm-hmm. anyway, the thing for me is this is all pretty exciting to think about. You have this tiny seed you hold in your hand that holds life. You put it in the right kind of soil and sometimes not even the right kind of soil. And it produces an amazing product, a plant that you can eat the leaves of or the roots or all the plant, and it and it gives you life in return. And that may sound sort of romantic, but I think that's the process of life. Okay. The one thing that you want to consider when you're looking at what you want to grow is to have a bit of a plan. This is a constant theme in everything we talk about. But to have a plan so that you know what plants complement each other and what seeds are going to grow better in what kind of soil. And so you might start with a soil test, which is easy enough to do. You can actually buy a little simple soil test to look at what they call the pH level of the soil um, because you need to have kind of a, a medium uh, pH in order to grow most things well. Some things need more acidity, some things seed need less. You also need to consider that some plants are going to do what they call cross-pollinate. So, for example, um, if you grow squash and cucumbers fairly close to each other, the birds and the bees are going to transfer some of that pollen to the cucumber and the cucumber to the squash, and you might end up with something that tastes a little wild. Um, uh, but isn't this how we got all varieties of... of uh, it is some of it. So mm-hmm. it's just good to know that those things can happen. Um, so the other issue is what is it we want to eat? So, you know, in Ohio and uh, Midwestern states, we tend to grow things like tomatoes and peppers and strawberries and those kind of things that everybody can't wait for uh, to be ripe in the spring and summer. Um, but a lot of things come from really far away, and that's, uh, that's part of the challenge. So saving seeds helps us to create um, our own garden, uh, our own. We can grow things in pots. We can grow things in the ground. Um, we can grow things uh, hydroponically uh, with water as, um, as a source. But the point is we can grow them, and that's what's the, the vital thing. So, for example, in seed saving, once we were growing that plant, at some point, at different stages, that plant has a DNA in it that says it's going to keep living. So that might be a biannual or a perennial, or it's time to die. And as soon as the plant signals that, it's going to send out the ability to grow seeds. And those seeds are what we're going to talk about next. Okay, well, you've been listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke, reminding you it is indeed the end of the world as we know it. And thank God. Thank God. And apparently once you start setting seeds, it's the end of your world as well because you're saying uh, in a lot of plants, as soon as they are in the process of dying, they begin creating the next generation. Yes, they do. Well, I know we we you're talking here, you know, the act of revolution, saving seeds, and um, apparently on larger scales, there's clearly a mindset, at least in some people, that saving seeds is important. We've seen this vast die-off of species as uh, agribusiness has taken over food production, and we've begun to see a lot in climate change and uh, you know deforestation and all of these other impacts that, that we see has an accumulated effect on the uh, biodiversity of the world. Um, In fact, I found it interesting that 53% of the world's commercial seed market is controlled just by the three companies you had mentioned earlier. Uh, Everybody's famous, favorite, Monsanto, um, DuPont, and Syngenta. As so you said. the beginning, sin. sin, sin. There We're we sin go. In that name. Telling and its and scale. since they've taken over, um, basically monopolizing the seed industry, um, seed prices have tripled. Which surprise, surprise, surprise. So, uh, but there have been some um, 
efforts, uh, the specific one, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. I hope I said Svalbard right. My Norwegian heritage is showing, but that's located in Norway. Um, There are seed banks all over the world. And one of the things that's happened uh, in some of the the issues in the Middle East particularly and other places too is that the minute that – a government wants to take over another government, one of the first things they do is blow up the seed banks, and then that destroys the heritage of the seed, all the generations of seed. And the ability to feed themselves. Yeah, and, that's right. Well, speaking of Svalbard, uh, my Nor- the Norwegian, um, uh, that was a case of uh, Syria just recently, in the Syrian civil war. Um, many, many, many species uh, were wiped out when they destroyed the seed banks of um, Syria during that. And fortunately, they had placed on deposit in Norway. Um, the um, So they've withdrawn some of those seeds to try seeds, and reestablish yeah. Yeah. those back. But this particular one, there are more than a hundred or uh, more than a million samples stored up Think there. Think of that. But we're only eating 10 varieties of food. So, right. so Mr. Positive today, Mr. which Positive. you are not, okay. uh, I want to talk Well, about if you're not <laughs> negative, you're not paying attention, folks. <laughs> well, that's, that's all yeah, there is Okay, to it. well, we get it that, that seed saving is a revolutionary thing, and there are a lot of reasons that motivate us. And I'm going to talk about some that are a lot more positive than um, the fact that they're, they're going to destroy us. Uh, the, the exciting thing about seeds is it's super easy to save them. There are a couple of ways. There are dry ways and wet ways to save seeds. So some each plant's a little bit different, but dry plants, we can go out and say, for example, I've, I've got a good example here. I have some kale that went through the winter, which is not easy to do in the Midwest. And, um, and so we ate kale in the fall, and then it sat there and didn't do anything over the winter. It looked like it's dead. And then in the spring, it started to come back when there were more hours of light during the day. And now it said it's seed. So I want to keep that seed. That seed is winter hardy, which means it's that plant's going to more than likely – Uh, when I sow those seeds are going to live through the winter. So I like to plant greens in the fall and we have those until maybe Christmas time. And then some of them die, some of them don't, and then they come back like gangbusters in March. Those seeds are dry seeds, so we can just go out and pick those pods and and open the pods and dry them on a either a screen or some paper towel or something, and then put them in an envelope or a jar once we're sure they're super dry so there's no mold or anything, and then we can save those until we need them. Uh, well, if- well, to interrupt you there, when you're saving these seeds, you know, all of the commercial seed banks I see, they seem to keep them like frozen or very close to frozen. Is that something you have to do or just keep them from you getting moisture? You, or You don't have to. Do you you do? want it to be dry. Uh-huh. So a paper bag, you also want to keep varmints out. So mice like to eat seeds, and you don't want that to happen. Yeah, if you have the ability to freeze the seeds, I guess that's fine. Um, most people don't have that ability, so it's just much better to say let's dry them. Or some things like potatoes, carrots. Uh, potatoes are virtually seed in that they're tubers, and when you get ready to grow potatoes, you cut the potato so that it has two uh, what they call eyes in it, and then one is for the stem to to come up through the ground, and the other is to grow roots. Yeah, there was that old book, uh, Grandma, Don't Bend Over in the Garden, because you know them taters got eyes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Whatever. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll move on from there. Um, anyway, so the other thing is the wet method. So this is a fun way to save seeds, too. So let's say you have an avocado or you have a persimmon and you want to or a pawpaw and you want to save the seeds so these are wet seeds in that you're going to cut the fruit open or the vegetable open and you're going to take that seed out and you're you're going to keep it now if in the case of pawpaws or persimmons um, you really need to keep that soil, that seed kind of moist. So I usually put them in a jar in the fridge until I'm ready to use them because once they start to dry out, they won't uh, propagate. And uh, avocado, I think well, it'll do its thing whenever. Aren't there some seeds where you actually have to 
Like get them cold for a period of time or they yes. won't germinate? Yes, some of them ha- require between four and six weeks to germinate. Mm-hmm. Some seeds required what they they uh, call scoring. So you have to wound uh, like castor bean or sometimes nasturtium. Uh, you need to wound that seed so that you create a, a place for the seed to, to germinate from. So seeds are cool. They're all a little bit different, and but and I don't want to make it sound like it's a difficult thing, because uh, it's not. It's not difficult to save seeds or germinate seeds. So for example, if you save some seeds and you've had them for a while, you're unsure if they're what they call viable. That means are they going to uh, are they going to send out a shoot? Are they going to be? Are they going to actually do something besides just lay there and look at you? Um, so what I like to do is to take the seeds and I'll take, I want to know, so let's say I have a package of seeds and seeds are getting more and more expensive and there are fewer and fewer seeds in the package. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But so let's say I want to know, uh, let's say I got a package of 50 seeds. So I want to know, are those seeds viable? I don't want to waste my time and effort and my resources by, uh, just sticking them in the ground or in little pots or whatever. So I'm going to take, say, five of those seeds, and I'm going to uh, get them good and wet, maybe soak them overnight. I'm going to put them in some wetted paper towel and roll them up. And in a couple of days, I'll come back, and they should have started to swell and send out something. And maybe I wait a few more days, but that's going to tell me, it's going to give me a percentage of how many seeds are likely to sprout and grow or be viable, as I said. And then I'm going to know, do I want to try to sow those seeds and, and grow them, or do I chuck that and move on to the next lot? Well, I can guarantee if I touch the seed packet, they are no longer <laughs> viable yeah. because they're going to die. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when, when you want to save seeds, um, as I said, some seeds are going to need to be dry. Some seeds you're going to need to keep in the refrigerator and not let dry out. Um but the other thing is you're going to want to mark those seeds so you know what is it. So, for example, if mark, I, mark the seed packet. Yeah, the packet. Not the seed, not the seed itself. <laughs> I could see that doing a little a scoring on a tomato seed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So let's say I like to grow Cherokee black tomatoes. And I love them. They're so delicious. And they're an ancient brand of seed or type of seed. So I'm going to write tomato. And then I'm going to write Cherokee black. And then I'm going to put the date that I put – uh, that seed in the packet. And I have a big Rubbermaid bin that I keep my seeds in, and I keep them in glass jars once I'm sure they're good and dry. And I save lots and lots of seeds. I save all kinds of flower seeds, all kinds of vegetable seeds. And people bring me seeds all the time. They're beautiful. They're like jewelry. They're all different. And uh, eventually you get to know when you see a seed exactly what it is. You might not know its exact brand. Like I don't know it's Cherokee black, but I know it's a tomato seed. Um, so what are some of the reasons that we would want to save seeds besides the fact that it's a fantastic Well, before thing. you get to that, because you okay. promised to tell me how come these things cost so much now. Okay. Because so, it used to be like seeds were like almost free. You go down – I just they remember gave as a them, kid, They used to give them away. Yeah, they'd be like whole racks of them, 19 cents for whatever my, you know, they were just uh, as cheap as chicken feed, which is not yeah. cheap anymore. In the early 1900s, the government decided they were going to encourage people and the seed uh, companies were going to encourage people to grow their own uh, gardens in, in uh, cities. So they gave away millions of seed packets and people started producing vegetables and fruits and it occurred to this to the seed companies, wait a minute, if we keep doing this, we're basically going to be out of business. So we're going to, that's when the whole thing of uh, air, uh, heirloom versus um, hybrid seeds started to happen because they realized if they made the seeds hybrid and changed the DNA, then you couldn't get the true plant back. So you'd have to buy seed the next year to do it. And I think I read somewhere where the very first lobbyist – Came was from for the seed, seed companies. companies. Yeah, yes. trying to stop the government from giving away giving seeds. Giving away seeds, yes. So, uh, so the, part of the reason I think seeds are expensive is that there's a lot of testing required. So 
People have, uh, I would say about five or six years ago, there was a big push again for local people and local farm situation to get people to try to grow things on their lots in town and um, and grow more food to feed themselves because it's a healthier thing to do. And um, so uh, libraries created some seed banks because lots of people have seeds, so you could bring seeds to them in little packets. And the government came in and said, wait a minute, have those seeds all been tested? We don't know. You might be cheating people. Well, for heaven's sake, they're giving them away. Mm -hmm. And uh, they stopped them from doing it because they would fine them with a a financial uh, fine if they gave the seeds away. So they did away with these little local seed banks. Now, people do exchange seeds still in small communities, but it's like a active revolution, an active revolution. Like uh, you can sell a gun easier than you can legally trade seeds. So mm-hmm. that that understood. That's why the well, cost seeds, of seeds. Well, seeds don't kill people. Plants kill people. Okay. Well, right. depends on which ones. If you eat the right <laughs> ones, they will kill you. Right. Um, you can take my seeds when you pry them from my cold, dead hand. That's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> So we have to think about this in terms of if every seed has to be tested to be true, that really adds to the cost of seeds. There are several seed companies that I like to patronize because I feel like they are uh, they are resisting these changes the government is trying to push. And so Baker Seed Company is one. Uh, Johnny Sheps. Um, there's there are a lot of them is out the there. The Baker Seed one, the one with the pretty catalog. Oh man, that catalog is so mm-hmm. it's like a picture book for the coffee table. So these are these are companies, and there are lots more out there. Seed savers. Not only do seed savers have seeds, but they also collect seeds from people, and they have a network where you can register to say that you have certain kinds of seeds and. Uh, how to exchange them or to sell them and things like that. So, so there's there's revolution out there happening and there's organizing happening. So, why do we save seeds? Well, first of all, it does save money. It also preserves the seeds for future generations. It preserves genetic diversity because lots of these seeds are being changed by corporations. And if we can get them in the hands of more gardeners, we have more likelihood of hanging on to them. The flavor is so fantastic in heirloom seeds, uh, things that we grow. It's a connection to your land and your own garden or your own pots of things. It's helpful to the pollinators because not just honeybees, but many, many pollinators, 80% of what we grow has to be pollinated by some kinds of bugs. And then it builds community because gardeners love to talk to each other, whether it's two pots on the balcony or a big piece of uh, ground that you've rented in a, an allotment in your community where you share with other gardeners. Or more importantly, it's a way to stick it to Monsanto. No, I don't think we can think <laughs> Okay, like that. I'll think that way. I think we can, have to you say— You can think positively. <laughs> it's not just positively. It's saying I'm living sustainably and I have control over my life in at least this one area and I'm doing a good thing for the, the world. Okay, well, you've been listening— to when the biomass hits the wind turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke. We'd like to thank our Emmy-winning producer, Adam Rich, and we'd like to thank you for just spending a wee little bit of time with us. And as your grandmother hopefully probably told you, the secret to a happy and sustainable life is... Annie? Play nice with others, clean up your own mess, and my grandma said, eat those delicious green beans. Okay, till next time. Mother Earth will sing and her children will be You can find more information on living sustainably in our unsustainable world at BlueRockStation.com. Blue Rock Station.